God, I do thank you so much for the prayers that have been made this morning, Lord, and the desire in the hearts of the people to walk in obedience to your word, Lord, for the desire that's been expressed to, to be changed by your spirit. Pray, Lord, that you would indeed change us this morning to be more and more like Christ. Lord, to, to give us the boldness and the courage to deal, Lord, with our, our weakness, our infirmities, Lord, and the sin that does so easily beset us, Lord. Pray, Lord, that you would help our faith, Lord, that you would raise our faith this morning, Lord, that we can see that the things that are impossible with men, Lord, they are possible with you. You're the God of the impossible. Lord, you can do anything. And I pray, Lord, that we, we would catch hold of that this morning, Lord. I thank you for both the warnings of the scriptures and the encouragements of the scriptures, Lord. And I pray that we might take both this morning, Lord, that we might balance them in our own minds and they might help us to walk circumspectly, Lord, carefully through this life, Lord, and to walk in that liberty that comes from your spirit, Lord. I just ask that you bless uh, my preaching, Lord, this morning. Pray that, Lord, you know that I feel weak this morning, Lord. I feel, uh, I'm, I'm aware of my own infirmities, Lord, but I know that although the arm of flesh will fail me, Lord, that your spirit does not fail us. Lord, and that there is power in you, Lord. And that as we come around your word, this is a spiritual thing this morning, Lord. And so I just yield up myself to you, Lord. And I pray that you would just take over, Lord, and you would just say what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are going to embark upon the last in this series uh, that we have been looking at uh, on surviving the apostasy. Remember that apostasy means falling away or, or quite literally standing away from, away from God, away from Christ. And uh, the, the, I guess, I guess the, the emphasis has been one of survival. Uh, you know, how do I, as a Christian, as a believer, make sure that I don't end up in this position? And you know, time and time again, the New Testament says, be not deceived, be not deceived. Do, I mean, do you think that people who are deceived know they are deceived? That's the whole point of it. And so there's this constant warning, be not deceived. Don't, don't you be that person who falls away. In fact, again, the Bible says, uh, you know, don't, don't, you know, beware you who think you stand, lest you fall. You know, don't, don't think, well, that's never gonna happen to me. Because it could. And so what we need to do is take on board these, uh, these warnings of the scriptures that they might arm us and prepare us so that we don't uh, end up in that, in that place of apostasy. And um, I'll just remind you again of the first verse that I used as we started this series, which was in Luke 18, verse 8, and the, sort of the latter part of that verse Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And that's really uh, the title that I'm going to give it this morning. Shall he find faith on the earth? Is he going to find uh, that faith? And we, we can, as we have considered from the beginning, the first uh, from the first murmurings of apostasy, I've tried to encourage us to carry out a sort of personal evaluation of our, of our own hearts. We looked at this on, on Friday night. The Apostle Paul says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove or test your own selves. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. So, so Paul is saying, look, do it. Test yourself. Look at your own heart. See whether you are in the faith. If you've seen the early warning signs of apostasy, 
then with it all urgency and with all uh, diligence, then you need to mortify it, you need to put that to death, you need to avoid it, you need to take those thoughts captive. In fact, the scripture says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. What are the first works? Well, think back to when you first became a Christian. That faith, that love, that, that desire for holiness and that belief in God. I can do this. God is so great. God is so amazing. I can do this. I know God's going to lead me. Nothing. You ever had that when you first got saved? Like, nothing's going to get in my way now. I know because I've got God. And what, and what I'm saying is, look, go back to that. You know, learn again. Do those first works. Have that first love where you just love everybody and, you know, and, and, and you want to share the gospel with everybody. Don't become jaded. Don't become cynical and say, oh, what's the point? You know, they are the first murmuring, I'm telling you, the first signs of apostasy. And that's what we looked at, wasn't it? Uh, we looked at the heart, the real you inside, and said, these are issues of the heart. They're not necessarily that it involves doctrine and false teaching, but apostasy is not at its heart about that. It's about you, it's about you inside, where it starts. And we looked at, you know, the, what goes on is a swapping of what you really value. And we said, you know, beware of the love of money coming into your life, because that can take the place of God. Beware of divisions coming up in, within the congregation. Oh, well, I like this person better. Oh, I like that person. You know, these, these kind of pointless divisions and beware of bigotry uh, and try and avoid it. So when Jesus returns, shall he find faith on the earth? Will there be any Christians uh, even left on the earth? Well, you know, the scripture warns about those who have a form of godliness, but deny the power that is to say, they look and they sound like Christians and they seem to believe the same thing that you believe, but uh, they do not, or, or maybe they no longer possess the inward power and the reality of being a Christian. That's what it's talking about when it says, when they deny the power, what's the power? The power to the supernatural power of God within you that, so you can overcome sin. So you can live this life. So on the outside, it all looks fine. But inside, there's no power. No power of living. So, I'm going to warn you this morning of three forms of this powerlessness. This is not, uh, what do you say? It's not comprehensive, okay? But these are, I think, the three main sort of categories you can fall into if you start to apostatize, if you start to fall away uh, from the Lord. So we'll look at three forms of this powerlessness and then we will conclude with how best to maintain a strong relationship with God and, and therefore, if you like, a robust defense against apostasy. So uh, three not so positive looks and then at the end we're gonna finish on, on so what am I supposed to do then? So I'm hoping it's going to be a, a practical, applied teaching this morning for you. So, what happens if you've been a Christian and you lose this power within you? If you start to drift away, you start to fall away from the Lord, what happens? Well, if you want to maintain the, the illusion that you are a Christian... Um, generally, this is what happens. And this is what Jesus said of the Pharisees, the religious people of his day. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Again, the emphasis is on the heart. Where is your heart at? You can say all the right things. You can give the right appearance. Yeah, this, this, this is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those religious people did, wasn't it? He said, yeah, on the outside you look like uh, uh, all white and pristine. You're like a sepulchre, like a tomb, like a whitewashed tomb, but inside full of what? 
rottenness, corruption, dead men's bones is the phrase that Jesus uses. And so how do you, how do you see that in today's society? Well, there is something that I'm becoming very much aware of, and you might as well. And uh, it, it's, if you like, a modern phenomena, and it's the... It is the phenomena of that honouring God with your lips or with your words, but actually your heart being far from him. And it's what I call the online crusader. Have you ever encountered these individuals? Um, I'm sure most of you have if you've ever been on the internet. These are the guys, and they usually are guys actually. I don't know why it seems to be a male thing. Um, who, who show up on the forums, they show up on social media, they, they show up in the comment sections on videos and that sort of thing. And, and you know, to you, they, are, they might be that sort of patronising, pedantic, pain in the neck. Uh, but that's not how they see themselves. They see themselves as, as a man on a mission. Yeah, they see themselves as a sort of a mixture between Elijah, John the Baptist, and Martin Luther. They are the self-appointed watchmen of, of everybody's comments. You know, and if you, you, if you comment on something online, or you, you, maybe you upload a video, or if you, if you do the whole internet thing right, and this is, by the way, not a rant against the internet, or you know, we use the internet as a church, we communicate the gospel in all sorts of different ways. But this is a particular type of individual. And um, if, you, if you say something they like, it'll be, amen, brother, amen, sister. But if you say something they don't like, you will rue the day. You will never, your ears will be ringing. And, and, and what's the problem with this? So we're all saying, yeah, I know. And you've probably got someone in mind as well. Maybe even a name is coming to your mind. But you know what? This could so easily be you. It could so easily be me. If we, we get into that righteous mode. But where is your heart? Where is the heart for the person that you're speaking to? It's a modern phenomenon. But therefore, I think it's something we need to, to be aware of. And, and, you know, I'm speaking to you as a pastor now. Because I've spoken to people who have this sort of persona. And I know that in, in reality, they don't exist. Now, I don't mean they don't exist as a person. I mean they don't exist as a Christian. They only exist here, online, on their computer, on their social media page. They, oh, that is not really them. You understand? This is, that's the only place that they are a Christian is online. And their lives are often miserable, lonely. You might say not surprising. They're often dysfunctional. And, and they're often, often really, really struggling with sin. But because they cannot face that sin, because they cannot deal with it, because their hearts have become hardened, they're, on, they're down on everybody else's sin. Yeah, they're down on everybody, they're hard on everybody else, but they excuse sin in their own lives. If that's you this morning, or if you feel, yeah, that might be me, that, might, that could so easily become me, then you need to repent. Because you, could, you will be well on the road to apostasy if you don't you need to allow God to soften your heart and to learn what it means to be compassionate again it's no good being passionate if you're not compassionate it's no good having really strong feelings about things if it's minus the compassion Christ was compassionate far more compassionate than he was actually passionate there's a compassion there. There's a love there. Without that love, you're that clanging gong. You know, you're nothing. Doesn't matter how much knowledge you've got. So you need to learn again what it means to be a Christian. You need to learn again what it means to have respect for others. To love others. And that that is the first thing. 
That is the most important thing. Not getting your point of view over. Learn to listen to others and learn to love others. So that is, yeah, I'm going to call it the online crusader. Make sure you don't become that person. Now the next uh, person we're going to look at, this type of person, is very different. And I'm going to call them the honest rebel. The honest rebel. This is a person who doesn't try and hide their sin. Okay. This is a Christian who says, yep, I, I'm a sinner. I sin every day. Yeah, my heart is disgusting. I'm disgusted with myself. I, I, I constantly fail. I constantly do what is wrong. I constantly sin. And that's why I need God. That's why I need God. That's why I need the grace of God. Because you see, I am this awful person. I am a horrible person. I do sin constantly. But I've got God. And God will forgive me and, 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 you know, it shows up the grace of God. Even greater, doesn't it? I'm so bad. Well, what I'd say is this. 10 out of 10 for honesty. Minus 10 out of 10 for doing the will of God. Because the Bible says, this is the will of God. Even your sanctification, that you are separated from sin. Um, the scripture says... In 1 John, chapter 2, verse 4, He that saith, I know him, that is, I know God, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, I don't think there are probably any more powerful words in the New Testament than those. I mean, John just lays it on the line, doesn't he? He just says, look, if you say you know God, but you don't keep his commandments you're an honest rebel against God, then you are a liar. You might have known God once, but you don't know him now. Because Christ came to call sinners, not to honesty, but to repentance. That's Christ's mission. That's why he came. Now, honesty is good. That's the first step. Admitting our sin is good. And so it says, doesn't it, in First John as well, that, that, that you know, if we say we have no sin, then we, you know, we, the truth is not in us. Of course we have sin, but we come to Calvary that Christ might deal with our sin and that he might empower us with the Holy Spirit so that now we are able to overcome sin in our lives. I'm not saying that once you become a Christian, you never sin. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm saying now you have a choice. Right? The Bible says that we are not tempted beyond what we can bear. But when we are tempted, there is a, God provides a way out. He shows us a way out from that. That we're no longer under the dominion of sin. And that's, why, that's what grace is for. There are some who turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, Jude says. Try and use it as an excuse. Like this person, this, this, this honest rebel, well, I'm all right because I've got grace. Grace is not an insurance policy, so you can go, I don't know, starting fires everywhere. You know, that's not what grace is for. The grace of God is such that you are able now to, to take that grace and take the power of the Holy Spirit within you and learn to walk in holiness and learn to walk um, uh, in obedience to Him. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You can't walk in obedience. You can't keep God's commandments, except that, that, that Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing at all. So unless you understand it's a supernatural thing that I have to have Christ in me if I'm going to live this life, then, you know, I'm not advocating salvation by works. I'm saying you can't do it without God. But I'm also saying we are called to do it. Yeah, we are called to do it. We're called to live in obedience uh, to Christ. We're called to follow him. If you are living like this, if you are living with, with, well, you know, I am a sinner, I sin every day, at least I'm honest about it, then you're well down the road of apostasy. If you don't understand that being a Christian means walking in obedience to Christ's commandments. Does Christ have commandments? Yes, he does. Lots of them. They say time and time again, unless you become like this little child. 
go, you know. Uh, unless you, you know, anyone who puts their hand to the plough and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom. You know, he, he, says, he says, lay not up treasure upon earth. That's a commandment. And Christ has many of them, but we can sum them up in, in these two. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And to love your neighbour as yourself. Because if, if, if you put those together, you love God, you'll want to walk in obedience to him. The next person I'm going to look at, and uh, this is the final of the sort of negative ones, is I'm going to call the easy believer. Now the easy believer could at one time have been actually really on fire for God. Quite typically, I'm generalising here, I understand that. I'm generalising, but these are generally true. You'll encounter this. The, so the easy, the easy believer is the one who's, maybe they've been on fire for God, they've, they, they've witnessed, uh, they may have even preached, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and they've been active for the Lord, but now they've compromised. Okay, It's, it's as if the Lord has put his finger... On, on their treasure of Achan, if you remember Achan, buries a little bit of treasure under his tent, just keeps it there, I'll, I'll keep that bit for me. Yeah, God puts his finger on something in their life and, and they were not willing to yield it to him. Like the rich young ruler, do you remember? He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, give your money to the poor. And that was the thing. He doesn't say that to everybody, but he said it to that man because he knew that that was that man's idol. That he was enthusiastic, he was zealous for God, but there was just something that he wasn't prepared to give up. And you can, you can you, if I was a betting man, I'm not, you can bet your life that that is going to be the thing that God's going to say, okay, this please, I'll have this. He couldn't do it. So now, rather like the man of the Gadarenes, this person seeks refuge amongst the tombs of the dead. What do I mean by that? I mean, they will deliberately choose a church that is not going to challenge them. Yeah? When they get in that position where they realise God wants them to do something, God wants them to give more than they've been given, they think, okay, um, I'm going to go somewhere where I'm not going to hear the gospel. I'm going to go somewhere where I'm not going to be challenged. And I can just kind of sit out the rest of my life in an easy sort of state. Yeah? And, and you find these quite often in these sort of churches. There'll be maybe one, two people there. And you think, what are you, what are you doing here? You know, and they tell you about their lives. And they tell you about what they've done for the Lord. And you're like, so why are you here? And, and quite often, this is the reason. This is the reason. They want to slip under the radar, an easy life, please. You know, I'm done with all this kind of striving and struggling. And I'm just going to sit here and, uh, and ride out the rest of my, my Christian life. Uh, and, and the, so they're maintaining the fact that they're still a Christian. They're still going to church, you know. But what does the scripture say about that? Do you remember in, uh, in Matthew, it talks about the parable of the talents. And in the parable that Jesus tells, uh, a certain amount of money is given to various people. And, and they're, supposed to, they're supposed to get interest on that money, right? They're supposed to make that money uh, work for them. But there's one of the people... And uh, he's only given a small, uh, a small talent. And so what he does is he buries it in the ground. Right? Let's have a look at it. It's uh, Matthew 25. I didn't read, want to read the whole thing. Just kind of put it in the picture really. Yes, yeah, so it's likened to a man travelling to a far country and he, and, and he calls his servants and, and delivers them to, to them his, his goods. And uh, verse 18 says, But he that received one talent went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. 
And what happens is that the, the Lord returns and, and, and he goes through these various people and they say, well, you gave me this. And look, I've improved. I've given, I, I've got more. I've used, I've used what you gave me for you. you know, I've been a good and a faithful steward. But then we read, uh, uh, I'm sorry, and the, and the Lord replied to them, verse 23, it's well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. But then in verse 24, it says, then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. Is Jesus a hard man? Is he hard on you? Reaping where thou hast not sown. Does Jesus ever reap where he hasn't actually sown? And gathering where thou hast not strawed. So he's making an accusation here against the Lord in this parable that is not true. Is this excuse, right? Well, I, I knew you were this hard man. I knew you were, you, you know, you were really tough. I was afraid and I went and I hid my talent in the earth. Lo there thou hast, that is thine. Here you are. This, this, is, this is what you gave me. And this is his reply. His Lord answered and said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Slothful means lazy. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strawed. So he's saying, so you, I'm a tough man, am I? I'm a hard man. Thou, if, if that were the case, and he says, thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges. And then at my coming, I should have received my own with usury, with interest. So he's saying, if I'm this person who's so tough, why didn't you take that money then? So that when I came back, I'd be pleased. So he's exposed his lie first of all and shown that he's what? Lazy. Just lazy. You want an easy life. You don't want to work for the Lord. But you still want to have, you still want to enter into that glory. You still want to enter into the blessing. But you're not willing to put up with any kind of uh, inconvenience, any self-sacrifice. It's all a bit too much. I want an easy life, but then I want to inherit what God has promised to his servants. Verse 29 says, For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's, his, that's how he ends up. So if, if that's you, or if you have those leanings, be careful, because it could, you could end up on that road to apostasy, to falling away from the Lord, because your heart is not right with God. If that's, if that's how you view it, if you think that being part of a church is going to save you on that day, you've not understood the Bible. You know, if you think that, like, giving your money to charity, or, or attending the meetings is going to put you in good standing with God. No, it's not. It's your heart. It's what are you inside? Do you know God? Do you know Jesus? Has he made that change within you? And, and, and if he did once, but not anymore, you need to repent. You need, there needs to be an urgency about your life. Get right with God. The Bible says, Awake thou that sleepest, and Christ will give thee light. If you're falling asleep, if you're falling asleep spiritually, wake up. Wake up this morning. And Christ will give you light. Christ will shine his truth upon you. And he will restore you to what uh, you were. So what's the answer? How, how, what sort of a person are we to be? To protect ourselves against that apostasy happening to us, that falling away. We've looked at the, the online crusader. The one who has the word but it doesn't have the heart. We've looked at the honest rebel. Well, I'm being honest with God. I'm just saying I'm a sin. I'm saying that I committed sin. Then repent. Stop sinning. <laughs> That's how I, you know, Christ came to call sinners not to remain sinners but to repent. And to believe on him and overcome sin in their lives. Or, you know, 
it, it's not the easy believer. Well, I'm still going to church. I'm still here. I leave, I leave a pretty good moral life. I had a friend who said to me, "Oh well, you know, I don't live. I don't live the Christian life. But if I meet anybody, I always tell them you need to believe on Jesus. I point it out to them. That's called hypocrisy. <laughs> you know, do you want to be? Do you think God?" admires you because you're a hypocrite because you tell everybody else they should believe on Jesus and follow him but you're not prepared to do it yourself that's, that's worse than being an open sinner so what's the answer what must we be well there's two words here that I'm going to give you that might seem to be almost throwaway, but they're really not what is required is for you to be the faithful friend just think about those two words for a second faithful faithful to God faithful to one another and full of faith the faithful friend in Isaiah 41 verse 8 God calls Abraham my friend can you believe that God actually calls a person a human being my friend and that is an amazing that should be the ambition of your life to be God's friend with all reverence and, and, and everything but, but for God to call Abraham my friend in Exodus 33 verse 11 says that the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend so there's a lot of power in this word friend John 15 verse 14 Jesus says ye are my friends you're my friends and then he lays down the condition for that friendship if always watch out when you get the word if <laughs> it shows there's a condition in there if you do whatsoever I command you so that's the condition to be Jesus' friend, is that you do whatsoever he commands you. In fact, uh, two chapters earlier, Jesus had given what he calls a new commandment. That, that is something new that he hadn't said to them before, to his disciples. Because he says it's a new commandment, but then it also says it, 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 it's a, this is the commandment you've had. From the beginning. This is a commandment of God. This is what God has always wanted. But now Jesus says, I'm giving it to you personally. And that commandment is what? Love one another as I have loved you. We are to be faithful, not just to God, but to one another. And some people will say, Well, yeah, I love God. I do love God. I've always loved God. But I do have a bit of a problem with some of his followers. You know, I do have a problem. I, I, I love God, but some of these Christians, they just do my head in. You know, they just, I can't, I can't deal with them. I can't cope with them. I can't stand them. But I love God. <coughs> First John 4, 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a, there's that word again, liar. You're a liar. Why? For he that loveth not his brother whom he can see, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? How can you love God who you can't even see when his somebody stood right in front of you? You can see him, you can talk to them, you can listen to them, but you can't love them, but you can love God. Not going to happen. First of all, you have to show and express to others that love. That's the proof that you're walking in Christ. Is that, and particularly that person who drives you nuts might be me. Uh, you know, if you you have to be able to love them. If you can, then you know the love of God is at work in your heart, changing you, changing you, so that you can be a faithful friend. A faithful friend. Never gives up. A faithful friend never leaves their brothers or sisters' side. 
Never, even if they're in sin, they, they're there straight away because they love them. And that is true Christian love. You don't ignore somebody who's in sin. You come to them and you share the truth of God with them and you try and win your brother, you try and win your sister back. A faithful friend is somebody who makes sure they are there in your time of need, who goes the extra mile, who weeps with you when you weep, who laughs with you when you laugh. A faithful friend is somebody who is dependable, devoted and dedicated to doing you good. The Bible tells us that we should provoke one another to love and good deeds. So if you want to protect yourself against this apostasy, this dangerous falling away from the Lord... You want to make sure that you don't make shipwreck of your faith. That you don't end up uh, a bigot and, uh, and, and somebody for whom the love of God is just a memory. Just something that happened years ago. Then don't stop loving. Don't stop loving God and don't stop loving your neighbour as yourself, even your enemies. Don't let your heart wax cold, but keep, cultivate and continue in the love of God. And that will protect you, that will prevent you from falling away from God. Don't stop loving. Don't stop loving one another. Whatever anybody else does. The, the song we sing. Love is a sacrifice. Love is a sacrifice. You know when we give our love. Not for reward. But because God loved us. Because God loved. Because Jesus Christ died for people. Who won't accept him. He died for people who reject him. He died for people who abuse him and despise him and say all sorts of untrue things about him. Is it any surprise that there are people who say that about you and about me? But it doesn't mean that we then withdraw our love. We continue to love them. And you can't do that unless the Holy Spirit is living within you. You can't do that unless you've got God in you. Because it's beyond any human capacity to do that. So if you want to keep that presence, if you want to abide, abide in Christ and for him to abide in you, don't stop loving God. Don't stop loving him and don't stop loving other people. And if you feel you have stopped or you're on the way to that, get before God this afternoon. Get before him, repent. Say, God, I need that love of yours in my heart. I need it to overflow to all these people that I know. Lord, that I might shine. I might reflect your glory. That I might not fall away. But that I might remain faithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that it... It challenges us sometimes, Lord, but, but it also gives the answer. It, Lord, you never just leave us in that state of fear or, or well, what shall I do? But Lord, you always give us the answer. You always tell us, Lord, how to be right with you. And I thank you for that, Lord. I pray that you would just inspire people here this morning to do that, to walk in obedience to your word in Jesus' name.